Welcome to Beyond the Beacon with Bishop Kevin Sweeney, a podcast of the Diocese of Patterson, New Jersey. Join us for weekly conversations about our Catholic faith and submit questions for the bishop today. I'm Jay Agnish. With me is Bishop Kevin Sweeney. Bishop Kevin, how you doing? I'm doing well, Jay. How are you doing? Doing well, thanks. Um, so we have an exciting episode today. We'll get into the introduce the guests in a little bit, but but what what's uh, what's happening with you? What what uh, what have you been up well, to? Well, um, we're filming on the feast of Saint John Bosco, so we wish all of our Salesian sisters and brothers and Salesian family a happy feast of Saint John Bosco. Uh, and we'll use his prayer as we begin. But um, I. You and I just came back from the cathedral from the mm-hmm. um, s- funeral for Sheriff Richard Burdnick, um, and we've received some inquiries, understandable. Um, uh, you know, having the podcast allows us to respond to some things, as we say, in real time. And um, actually, a week ago, um, let Tuesday of last week, I, I got a call from Monsignor Gino Silva, our the rector of our cathedral, um, who's known Chief Burdnick and his family for many years. Chief had four has four grown children and five grandchildren, um, his wife, Monica, um, and um, they had just gotten the news. Um, and Monsignor Gino had gone over to be with the family um, um, as they heard the news that their dad had taken his life and... Um, um, so we pray for them, and um, maybe not everyone is aware that it's really more than 20 years now that um, in the past there was a, a policy in the church that if someone had taken their life that they couldn't be buried, from have a funeral mass or be buried in a Catholic cemetery, and that's unfortunate. It was the best understanding that they could have at the time, um, because life is sacred and uh, we're given the, our life as a gift. Uh, but as we have uh, grown in developing the understanding of human person, psychology, counseling, other um, um, fields, uh, you know, um, for something to be a serious sin, somebody has to be um, uh, have free consent of the will. And uh, when someone is under some kind of terrible pressure for whatever reason, um, you know, uh, or a particular illness, problem could be mental right, illness, yeah. could be depression, could be um, what's going on in someone's heart or someone's mind. Mm-hmm. Um, whatever it might look like on the outside, we don't know. Only God knows what's going on. And so, um, uh, you know, yes, God is just, but God is also merciful. And, and Jesus came um, uh, to conquer sin and death and uh, for all and, and to save us and to give us eternal life. And Yes, we believe there's going to be a judgment. He's, Jesus was very clear about that, and we're going to have to answer for our actions. But, you know, thinking somebody, getting to know a little bit about um, Chief Burdnick, and he was a Clifton police officer for many years, a Knight of Columbus, a, a Eucharistic minister in his parish, again, mm-hmm. husband, father of four children, grandfather of five children, um, and just to hear people, the, the goodness, um, uh, a life of caring for others, trying to help others, um, um, you know, does one moment of weakness um, uh, take away all that good? I don't, we don't. We we can, I think, be confident in God's mercy. And again, for a long time now, the church has said um, we 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 don't know what was going on, and and so what kind of if that person had freedom or not when they made that choice. So so yes, trusting in God's mercy, there can be a funeral, a funeral mass, and mm-hmm. burial in a Catholic cemetery. And uh, having heard from some. Um, people maybe, you know, whether it was 30 or more years ago and uh, a family member committed suicide and they were told they couldn't have a mass or couldn't be buried, um, that's, you know, the, the, when she teaches, um, you know, uh, in, in, uh, from the Holy Father and with all the bishops, that yes, there is an infallibility to church teaching, but that doesn't mean that the church is perfect, that the church hasn't made mistakes, we know that. Mm. Um, the church is made up of human beings and sometimes in with the best of intentions and prayer um, and listening to the scriptures and tradition, um, um, there are um, uh, disciplines, let's say, that um, um, that in hindsight um, were not really the best. So um, we can understand someone 
uh, if they have especially had a family member who didn't couldn't have a funeral or wasn't buried yeah and now to see uh, uh the, the chief um wake had the wake was at the cathedral and um and his funeral today um but i think if um any of those of us who were there today could Monsignor Gino gave a beautiful homily yeah, a very honest homily um, and he had spent time with the family and mm-hmm. yes talked about there could be anger and, and certainly sadness um, but there was also um, faith hope and love that's what we believe and um, and so um, so we walk by faith and, and, and we live in hope and, and we believe that his love is conquered sin and death so um, we pray for um, Chief Burnick and for his family and anyone who's lost a loved one in any way, but especially um, someone who's uh, uh, anyone who knows someone who's d- taken their life. Uh, and we know also, as Monsignor Gino mentioned, you know, it's a particular problem, whether it be mental illness or other depression or, you know, that suicide rates are up. Get help. You know, there's we can, um, the suicide prevention lines and um, the parish priests are, were there to, help um, uh, uh, ask somebody for help and um, uh, um, uh, it, whatever problems there are we can face them together and and so um, we would hope anyone that might feel like um, they're, they're, they're thinking of um, taking their life that they would know that God loves them and that there's a way out of this and and there's a better way mm-hmm. um, for a and temporary that help problem available. Right. That's right. that's right that's yes, right yes right right yeah, it was, so, a, it was a powerful uh, funeral, and you gave the, it's known as the commencement. Final commendation. Com- prayers commendation, commendation prayers. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, and it, uh, um, we're um, a community, we're God's family, and as a Catholic community, as a Christian community, and as a wider community, and uh, and each of those communities was represented, um, the Patterson community, the Clifton community, the Passaic community, the state community, um, so we're grateful for all those, you know, that were there for the family. And, and as often is the case when, whenever we lose a loved one, um, sometimes we're there for the family at, at the wake and the funeral. And, but it's those days and weeks, uh, afterwards that we need to be there for one another as well. So mm-hmm. we'll, we'll make sure we do that as best we can for the Burdenick family. Well, yeah, thanks for sharing that Bishop. And also for the statement that you gave to, to the media and that's available, um, online and we'll have something in the beacon next week um, and I know that I, I also received a question uh, from someone outside the funeral asking about oh the Catholic Church is doing funerals for people who um, you know committed suicide so um, thanks for for that um, all right so do we want to open up in prayer can you tell us about yes we'll we'll pray the Saint prayer that we use Don for the Bosco. mass for Saint Don Bosco today but as we do that Saint <coughs> Don Bosco a great Saint for young people and an educator and uh, the Salesians, certainly uh, great educators. And uh, this is Catholic Schools Week, so I was privileged uh, and happy to be at Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish on Sunday uh, for a Catholic Schools Week Mass at DePaul Catholic uh, on Monday and St. Philip's on here in Clifton on, on Tuesday. And on Friday, I'll be at Holy Spirit Parish in School in, in Pequannock. So um, we want to support our Catholic schools, and, and we certainly this week in a particular way celebrate our Catholic schools in this Catholic school week. So let's pray for them as we uh, ask the help and intercession of St. John Bosco. We'll place ourselves in God's presence, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O God, who raised up the priest St. John Bosco as a father and teacher of the young, grant, we pray, that aflame with the same fire of love we may seek out souls and serve you alone through our lord jesus christ your son who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the holy spirit god forever and ever amen, amen. In the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen amen yeah so um we have a very uh special guest we've been looking forward to for a few weeks now to have on so we're, we're going to go to a, a and f- the timing is great uh yeah because for the chosen fans so we're going to be talking about the chosen today with uh, Jerry Jenkins, uh, the author, uh, father of Dallas Jenkins, uh, the creator, um, and uh, tomorrow will be uh, opening in the in theaters um, the fourth season of The Chosen. Yeah, how about that for timing? Yeah. So let me do a quick uh, introduction for Please. Jerry. So so Jerry B. Jenkins has written more than two hundred books, including twenty one New York Times uh, bestsellers with sales of more than seventy three million copies. He's known for biblical fiction end times fiction, such as the Left Behind series that he wrote, 
um, and other genres. Jerry also assisted Billy Graham with his memoirs and has written numerous sports biographies, including those of Hank Aaron, Walter Payton, Nolan Ryan, and Oral Hershiser. Jerry became a Christian at six years old through the guidance of his mother. At 15, he rededicated his life to the, to the Christian faith and later attended Moody Bible Institute. He started his writing career when he was 14 as a sports writer for a daily newspaper and published his first book at age 24. So he's got a new book out. It's entitled The Chosen and I Will Give You Rest. It's based on the record-breaking television series created by his son, Dallas Jenkins, which is in, in, his, in this third offering, readers experience the emotions, personal narratives, and transformation of those who have encountered Jesus, including the disciples Simon and Simon's wife, Eden. The Chosen is the first ever TV series about Jesus and his disciples. It has been seen in every country in the world with over half a billion views. <coughs> the series is on pace to be translated into 600 different languages. And I know, Bishop, you often recommend The Chosen. I know some of our parishes are doing small uh, group meetings where they're watching The Chosen. And so we're very much looking forward to this interview. So why don't we, why don't we go to that interview now? Great. Jerry, how you doing? It's Jay Agnish from Beyond the Beacon, and with me is Bishop Kevin Sweeney. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. Great to be with you both. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for the time. Um, so you started as a writer at, at a young age, huh, teenager? Yeah, I actually talked my way into a sports writing job before I was old enough to drive. My <laughs> mother had to take me to the ball games and back to the newspaper office, but... Uh, yeah, I knew, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I thought I'd be a sports writer my whole life. I kind of keep still keep a hand in that, but uh, obviously I've broadened out from there. I was hoping to play for the New York Yankees. Lou Pinello was my favorite player. <laughs> wow. Um, and yeah, he, he was manager of the Cubs for a while. That's right, yes, and the, and, and the Rays and, um, and, the, and the Mariners. Um, uh, and in terms of your books, uh, Hank Aaron, Walter Payton, Nolan Ryan, and Oral Hershiser, right? Yeah, and uh, and Brett Butler, the uh, the da former oh, Dodger, sure. yeah. um, and Cleveland Indian, right for a time, I think. Yeah, he was with the Indians. That's right. Or Oral was too. Yeah, yeah uh, right. Um, maybe just a quick word about each one. I know it's a the be on the beacon, for, but uh, <laughs> I think the listeners know I'm a sports fan, so. Yeah, I had uh, the, the first big break for me was my, my fourth book was was with Hank Aaron. And uh, I was such a fan and I was so young at the time, early 20s when I met him, I was almost speechless. I wasn't a very good interviewer because right, right. I was just sitting there gazing, gazing at him. <laughs> but uh, he, he was obviously something special and, and one of the greatest players of all time. Right. Uh, the fun thing about doing the pitchers books was was watching them warm up. I remember watching Oral throw in his 92-mile-an-hour sinker. And I, I remember thinking, I don't think I could even catch a big league pitch, <laughs> let alone hit one. And when I was watching uh, Nolan Ryan warm up in the bullpen before a game, oh, man. He, he said, uh, would you like to grab a bat and stand in and give me perspective? And I said, yeah, I would, but I only brought one pair of pants. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the catcher said, uh, yeah, like we would allow a civilian to stand in against a 100-mile-an-hour fastball. So I got out of that one. <laughs> Even though I was always a Yankees fan, uh, I, I, watching um, Doc Gooden and Roger Clemens, um, a fastball and a, a killer curveball, um, and then Ryan was later in his career, but um, those power pitchers, they, they're really not around as much anymore. Um, but um, Hershiser, the bulldog, and that streak, was it an 88 with the Dodgers, the scoreless streak? Yeah, and that's when I did his book was the, the last last month or so of '88 after the World Series, and that was my first New York Times bestseller. Was the was uh, the Oral Hershiser uh, autobiography? He, yeah, he's a he's a great guy. Um, uh, we could talk about sports all day, but maybe um, then um, is it Tim LaHaye, right? The Left Beyond series. Right. Um, yeah, Doctor LaHaye had the idea for that, and. Uh, um, I remember my agent called me and asked me if I'd ever met Dr. LaHaye, and I had not met him, but I had published him in magazines and stuff like that. And, and he said, well, he's a nonfiction best-selling author 
with a great fiction idea, and you're a novelist with no ideas, so we should get you guys <laughs> together. So, and left, uh, left behind, and the rest is history. Is that it? It really is. I mean, it. Um, you know, he, he he was so great. He he had the idea, and he was the scholar and theologian, but he he didn't want to help write it. He was not a fiction writer, so wow. I got the fun part. But it was it was like going to the La Haye Seminary for about twenty years. Um, and I mean, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's so centered on the faith, right? I mean, similar to to the chosen, the, the scriptural. Yeah, and, yeah, kind of ironic. Um, the chosen obviously is based on the you know first century uh, Holy Land when when Jesus was on Earth, and the Left Behind was the other end of the spectrum. Oh, yeah. uh, when, the when we believe the, ra- the rapture, so right. I'm I'm kind of covering both ends of the spectrum there. Right. Wow, well, um, and I guess you've learned a lot about the faith along the way from from there till now, huh? Yeah, I grew up in the church and, uh, um, you know, always loved Bible stories and, and the Bible and uh, attended Moody Bible Institute for a year when I got out of high school. And so, yeah, I've always been a person of faith. And um, and you said your mom was a big instrumental in your in your faith, right, from reading your Bible? Is that, is that right? Yeah, she really was. When I was a kid, I had rheumatic fever. I was in the hospital for uh, a few weeks. And she had me memorize the, the whole chapter of John three, wow. and uh, and then to, years later to see my son, you know, create the chosen and 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 bring that scene to life on screen was really a moving moment for me. Um, that, that was just fantastic. How many children do you have? I have three grown sons. Dallas is the oldest, and then uh, our middle son is uh, um, sports information director at Mid American Nazarene University in mm. Kansas. And, uh, and then our youngest son uh, lives not too far from us here in uh, Colorado. Before um, I uh, be really became a fan of The Chosen, uh, I remember early on, I guess, um, I think Dallas and and Jonathan Rumi had the opportunity to meet Pope Francis, right? Is that, is that that happened? Early? Yeah, that that was really quite amazing. And, and uh, Dallas was <laughs> impressed that the Pope had a sense of humor because uh, <laughs> Dallas introduced himself and, and said, you know, he said, I'm a Protestant, but I want this story to be, you know, enjoyed by anybody who loves Jesus. And, and the Pope says, then he points to Jonathan, he says, so you, you're you Jesus. He points to Dallas and says, so you're Judas. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have a sense of humor, right? So, yeah, that's um, great. And I, I'm sure it's been told, but um, I, I don't think I've heard it. Um, what got Dallas started towards the, the Chosen? Well, it really was born of failure. He had been in Hollywood about 20 years and had done several feature films and, and was doing pretty well. Um, but he had a really big break with a, a big studio, and they, they tested a movie. It was called The Resurrection of Gavin Stone. It was a faith-based picture. And uh, it tested better than anything this studio had ever done. And they said, boy, if this works the way it looks like it's going to, we want several movies from you over the next 10 years. And it just absolutely bombed. It, it just wow. just failed in the box office. And Dallas and his wife were sort of up in the night and praying and crying. And they felt led to read the, about the feeding of the 5,000. So they just they did that. They weren't sure why. And then uh, Dallas's wife went to bed. And he was staying up trying to, to you know, deconstruct what happened, what went wrong. And, and he'd gone from being this you know, a director with a great future to really having no future because obviously that was the end of the, the deal for, the, for that for that uh, producing uh, right, house. Right. And um, he got a, an email in the middle of the night from a friend of his, he, somebody he'd never met, but he'd corresponded with, and the guy happened to be in Romania. Man. And so Dallas was kind of wondering, why are you writing to me at 3 o'clock in the morning? He said, well, I'm in a different part of the world. And he said, I just, you know, God told me to tell you something, and I at first refused. I, I first uh, disobeyed and said, I'm not going to, that would seem weird for me to tell him, <laughs> tell him this. And <laughs> like Jonah. He said he wouldn't let me, yeah, he said he wouldn't let me alone on it. So what he, all he wants me to tell you is it's not your job to feed the 5,000. It's your job to bring the loaves and fish. God wow. does the miracles. You just wow. do your part. And Dallas said that just, you know, from that moment on, that was back about six years ago, I think, six or seven and Jonathan and, um, Rumi, I think, has a similar story, right? He felt he was just about done as an actor in, in California, right? Yeah, he was broke and not finding work and uh, didn't know what he was going to do to even eat. And he said he just got on his knees and said, you know, he'd, he'd been a, a believer. He's a devout he turned Catholic. It over. And, yeah, turned it over. And, and he said that very day, a 
couple of checks came in the mail right, that kept him right. alive. And then Dallas called him and said, Dallas had used him for a short film in his in his church uh, about the, the crucifixion. Oh, yeah. And um, he had actually tested him to play one of the thieves on the cross. <laughs> but uh, he said he, he thought at the last minute, let me try you for the Jesus role, which is a much smaller role in that short. But um, he, he, he thought he was really a great performance. And so he, he called Jonathan and, you know, when he got the idea for The Chosen and said, um, you know, you're ready to put the sandals back on and, and uh, talk about the rest is history. This thing's just exploded. Yeah, man, it sure. I, I, I was serving as a priest in Brooklyn and Queens for 23 years and got a call in uh, the end of March in 2020 in the midst of the lockdown that the Holy Father was naming me as the next Bishop of Patterson. And um, I came in July of 2020, and I think that 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 fall or late in the year, I got an invitation to an evangelization conference for bishops in October of 21. And I thought, mm-hmm. well, if people are ever going to be flying again and traveling, <laughs> maybe I, that's be something to go to. It turns out I went to that, and they had small groups. I was in this group with three other bishops, I think, and they start talking about, I had you know, seen it on Facebook, just references to it. And they started talking about having watched this show, The Chosen. This was the first season. And um, how it brought the scriptures alive and how it helped them in their preaching. And I came back from the conference and I found it online and watched the first few episodes. And uh, I've been a fan ever since. Uh, it really mm-hmm. brings the scriptures to life. It's um, um, And looking forward now to the fourth season. But um, I've been uh, listening to uh, to your book. This Is this the third one you've written from this, from the right, I, I, yeah, I've written one for each to go along with each season. Um, I, I read a novel based on on what you see on the screen, and uh, and the scripts, of course. And you know the, what, what you see on the screen is based on the Bible, um, and then my novels are actually based on those. So we're kind of doing it backwards. I feel like I'm sort of pressing my nose up against the glass, asking Dallas if I can play too. You know, well, you know, <laughs> and, uh, um, I think anybody that um, that enjoys the show would love the opportunity to you know, read it even meditatively. I mean, it is a reflection that, you know, you, uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola talked about using um, your imagination as you read and pray with the scriptures. And that's certainly, I think, the case here. And um, again, I've, I'm sure it's been talked about, but the backstories and the characters that, that are brought in, um, I've always been a fan of uh, Zachariah. Even two weeks ago was the gospel where he allowed, you know, his two sons to leave the, him in the boat. Um, and his character is just so lovable, you know, <laughs> and, and Mary Magdalene yep. and um, the, the, I think it's the Ethiopian woman. Um, where did, where did Jonathan come up with some of the, the characters and, and excuse me, um, Dal- Dallas, where did he come up with some of the characters and backstories? Well, really, he, that's just the, his imagination and his two co-writers. They, they said, you know, we know the stories from Scripture, and when we show those on screen, when we show a miracle or, or the sermon, we want that to really mirror what's in the Bible. We don't want to detract or, or make any changes there. But we're just saying sometimes it's only two or three verses. You'll see a couple of verses about a miracle, and they say, what if we knew this person's name? And what if they had friends who, who conversed with them? What might they have said? And they said, we want to really be careful to make it plausible but make it really realistic so people can relate to them. And he even took, you know, the disciples, we know, we know all their names, but we kind of see them as stained glass window characters or statues. Simon the Zealot, Simon the Zealot, Z as they called him, you know, and that I think was it his brother, right? That was healed um, by the well and, uh, and how that character is developed. And and as you say, um, bringing those names to life is just really. Yeah. And we know from scripture that, that, uh, I mean, we don't we don't see anywhere in Scripture where it says that it was Simon uh, the Zealot's brother who right. was healed. But Dallas is just saying, what what if it was, and and how would that go? And then uh, and how did the and Zealot right, become of, part of the twelve? Yeah, right? that that was really interesting. I thought how they how they pulled that off, and they give me poetic license, you know, literary license to to even go further with that in the novels. So it's it's been great fun. So yeah, maybe Jerry talk about. Um the, how did the idea come about to write your novels um, based on, on, on the show and and maybe some of the differences bet- between the two? Yeah, that, that's, that was the big question initially, was if we do novels, will people want to read them because they've already seen what's on the screen and they, they probably have read the scriptural accounts. And uh, Dallas and his co-writers, you know, knowing my history of writing fiction, they said, 
you know, use your imagination to add more backstory, more characters, more dialogue, and especially more inner monologue. What's happening in this, these characters' minds? Mm. And uh, so, in, in fact, the, the scene that you mentioned, uh, the, the character who's um, healed at the, at the Bethesda pool, right. um, oh, on, on screen, they did that without dialogue. They just showed him falling out of a tree, his father mm. running to help him, and uh, him growing up with his brother and that type of thing. And so I just kind of t- tried to bring that to life with dialogue and, and other stories. And uh, people have really responded well to it. It's been really gratifying. I am. Um, I'm a fan of audio books and I'm listening now to this, to the, to the, uh, your current book on um, the third one. Um, and uh, I just listened to um, Matthew's uh, reunion reconciliation with his parents. And I think uh, for so many, uh, the portrayal of Matthew, um, you know, we hear about the tax collector, but um but his portrayal um, uh, with his personality and uh, and his interaction with the other um, apostles, uh, he's feeling left out at the beginning. The, uh, he and the women are going to learn the Psalms. <laughs> um, but it, 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 it brings such a humanity to the ex- experience of the scriptures. Yeah, it's really, um, it's really stunning how they did a Matthew as really a person on the spectrum and, and, right. and probably autistic. Right. Da- da- Dallas has a, a daughter who's autistic and she's very high functioning. She's in college now and straight A student and her own grade and everything. But, um, but he was sensitive to that. And he, as he's studying the, the character of Matthew said he was good with numbers yeah. and he was good with detail. His gospel is more detailed than all the rest and has lots of really interesting facts in it. And he said, he very well could have been on the spectrum. We don't know that, but he portrays him that way. And they've gotten thousands of responses from families that have kids on the spectrum and say, mm-hmm. you know, my, my child is watching this show like nothing else and just loves that character. So it's been a real ministry. And even the, the line in the book, and the, remember it um, in, the, in the show, um, when he talks about his friends, I think both to his parents and to, uh, is it Gaius, the Roman centurion? He used to be his bodyguard, I guess, uh, you have friends? Um, and Matthew kind of saying, yeah, I, I do have friends, you know? Um, that's right. It, it's, um, yeah, that's right. And the guy who plays Gaius, his name is Kirk B.R. Wohler, and uh, he's an old friend of Dallas's and has been in every movie that Dallas has ever made. Wow. And uh, in fact, he's got one coming up, the, the best Christmas pageant ever. It'll be out for next, next Christmas. And uh, he's in that one too, but he's a great actor. I'm sure this um, it's going to be great. Uh, it's I guess is it um, tomorrow or that uh, February first, right? The fourth season comes out in theaters. Yeah, my wife are going to go to the first showing here in uh, Colorado Springs. We can't wait ourselves. We we've got some sneak previews, but it'll be fun <laughs> to see it on the big screen. I can't wait! I can't wait. Why do you think it's done so well, the the chosen Jerry? I really think it's the idea of of how they've made these characters so relatable. When, when we see the disciples, rather than, I mean, we do, you know, nowadays we, we do revere them as apostles and, and great giants of the faith, but Scripture is clear that they were petty, they could be annoying, they could be jealous, they could be ambitious, hmm. and that's like us, and we can identify with those kind of guys. So Dallas made them you know, sort of blue-collar workers, they're fishermen, you know, that's, the Scripture's clear about that. And, uh, and when it talks about that they were asking for the, for, to, to sit on Jesus' right and left hand in the kingdom, that's the kind of stuff we would do, you know? And so people are watching this and saying, hey, these are, are real people. And, and Jesus, well, he's often hard to identify with in movies or TV shows because he's perfect. So Dallas gives him a sense of humor and the well, sense of yeah, camaraderie exactly. with his friends that really makes him relatable, too. Um, and his relationship with Mary, you know, um, with his mother. Um, and, uh, you know, that we hear one line in the scriptures in some sense, you know, Peter's mother-in-law, and we know that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. Well, to get to know Eden, right, um, and to see yep. the relationship with Peter and Eden as husband and wife, accepting Peter's call, uh, the relationship between Jesus and Eden, saying Jesus saying to Eden, you saw it in him first. Um, and yep. uh, And then... I guess it was the end of the third season where, um, no spoiler alert, it's a spoiler for those who haven't seen it, but, um, you know, that she had a miscarriage. Um, and and right. to relate that with the scene of walking on the water, I mean, wow. And, and but yeah, that, the, 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 that you say about it being relatable, even, you know, the, the, married, the married couple and the relationship between 
Peter and Eden, uh, it, it brings it so much to life. Yeah, and that's a perfect example of, in Scripture, the only way we even know that Peter is married is because he had a mother-in-law. Right. That's all we know about that. We don't know his wife's name. We don't know about that relationship. And so they, those writers, to, to invent that, that scene in that story, um, you know, it's not, it's not biblical, but it's, it's plausible, and right. it brings the whole thing to life. I just love that part of it. Right. Uh, when they came back from being sent out two by two, and uh, actually she, I guess, probably had just had the miscarriage and wanted to tell Peter. And I, um, I remember watching it, you know, really struggling to that she, um, uh, Peter. There's a great scene where Peter and, and, and Gaius, right, are trying to fix the, um, the, uh, the, the sewage problem in, <laughs> in the town. And uh, uh, Gaius gives Peter some marriage advice and it doesn't go well. Uh, but, right. but eventually they, they work it out and, and, and they're able to, you know, share that grief of, of losing a child and, um, um, and, and, and the way that Jesus ministers to them, um, not heavy handed, but being there and, and understanding what they're going through is just, um, again, really a beautiful portrayal. Yeah. So, I find that I, you know, I have to, I watch, I get to watch these, you know, over and over to do, to do the books. And I find, I mean, I've always thought that everything my son did was brilliant. This time I was right. And, uh, but, but in getting to watch these so many times, I find that I'm moved by every scene, every time. I never get tired of them, and they always move me emotionally. Right, right. right. And Jerry, so you, you taught your son everything he knows, right? <laughs> well, I'll be happy to take all the credit. <laughs> but you, um, I, I was looking around on your website, and you, you, do, you do some training for writing workshops and, and, and coaching or can you get, get into yeah that? i have about i have about 2000 online writing students and uh, oh, at wow. jerry jenkins dot, dot, at jerry jenkins dot com mm. and uh it's everything from free daily tips and blogs and things like that up to courses that you can buy and and participate in but i find that very gratifying i feel obligated to to pay it forward i've had a, a dream career yeah and uh so I, I'm really enjoying that part of it too. What can you share us, with us a nugget? Like what what is something that you might um, share with uh, some insight or wisdom with a, with an aspiring uh, new author or someone who wants to wants to write yeah, books for a living? That, or? Right. One of the things I tr I try to tell people and it and it does kind of bring them up short is they say, well, I've always wanted to write a book and so I want to I want to learn to be a writer, and I say, you know, a book is not where you start. A book is where you arrive. So you need to start with short things. Write something for your church newsletter. Write something for a local paper. Mm. Try to sell articles to magazines or short stories. Learn to be edited. Learn to be critiqued. Learn the business. And then your, your time will come when you're ready, when you've got a good idea for a, for a novel or, or for a nonfiction book. Um, then that's the time to, to, to become a, a, an author. Mm. That's great advice for, for you. Jerry, when so it was age twenty four, you wrote your first novel. When do you feel like you, you, you hit, hit the ground running or, or hit your stride as far as uh, writing in a, in a way that you were satisfied with or felt like? I'm I'm still hoping to get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've actually I've actually been a a, a full time uh, I've been a published author for fifty years now. Yeah. And uh, I still feel like I learn something new every day. That's another thing that's surprising to students. They say, when did you know you loved writing? And I say, you know what? I love everything about writing except the writing. <laughs> I, I love being an author. I love being known as an author. I love having written. I love having succeeded. I love the spoils that come from it. I love the ministry of it. But writing, if you do it correctly is grueling mm. every time, even now. I feel like I compare it to being a marathon runner. Ask a marathon runner at the 20 mile mark right, if they don't yeah. just <laughs> love, love running, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, maybe let's say a word about um, your experience of the faith community. I guess um, I'm thinking that the evangelical community um, would have embraced the um, the Left Behind books. Um, I'm not sure of that, but um, maybe the experience of the faith community in, you know, what became uh, such a, a popular series, and then maybe transitioning from there to some of the reactions or responses you've heard from the faith community in terms of um, both the show and, and now the books uh, of The Chosen. Yeah, that's been really bizarre when you think about it, to have 
lightning sort of strike the same family uh, twice within a generation. I mean, I was in my mid forties when Left Behind came out, and it was just overwhelming. I mean, I think at one point they were saying that one in eight people in the United States alone had had read Left Behind, and so I had to really get used to that um, that sort of overwhelming success and and keep the focus on the, the ministry and the you know the task and then you know t- basically 28 years later or so Dallas in his mid 40s now has this hit and it's it's just skyrocketed so I've been able to tell him some advice I got from Dr. LaHaye too that you need to let the phenomenon take care of itself and stick to the knitting because um, you know, you didn't write this to, to, to be a, a success or to be a bestseller or to, to have, you know, these means come to you. Um, you had a purpose, you had a reason, you had a why and concentrate on that and, and let, you know, so that was sort of my introduction to what Dallas is going through. Of, you know, it's not our job to do the miracle. Our job is to do our job and, and, and bring, bring our loaves and fish and God does the rest. And, um, you know, not, don't really want to get political, but um, I do um, care for and love our country. And, you know, we certainly have challenges at the moment, but, you know, that maybe some don't realize the, 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 the deep tradition of faith that has been so much a part of our history and, 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 and how much we still are a country of faith, right? And people, um, I think, are, are, are looking to, um, you know, bring that faith into the the public square, but also maybe our, even more so communities. And um, uh, can you say a word about that in terms of maybe some of your experience of the the church of faith communities and reactions to both either um, Left Behind or, or the Chosen? Yeah, I think this has come to light, especially the last few years, with all the sort of lunacy we see out there in society of things that are accepted or even called good and that we know are not. Um, the, the fine line we have to draw is um, we're supposed to love everybody, even mm-hmm. people we are diametrically opposed right, to, right, you know, philosophically right. or politically right, or whatever. Right. And somehow the church has gotten this reputation of being uh, hateful toward people right. who are suffering. Right. Right. And and so, you know, our, our goal is to say, look, we want to love people and yet still be firm in, in our beliefs and our biblical stands on things. And it's hard. Um, because, you know, you're called a bigot or a hater if you say anything that, right, that goes right, against what right. people are saying. And uh, and as I say, you know, a lot of it is just is just lunacy. And I, I'm, I'm not sure there's a solution for it this side of heaven. But um, our goal is to see people get closer to Jesus, learn more about him, love him more, come back to their faith, back to the Bible. Um, I do find there's a lot more cooperation between the different stripes of Christianity uh, one of one of my wife's and my best friends and, a, and a almost daily correspondent is a Carmelite nun oh, from wow. England. Wow. Uh, she she became a fan of the Chosen and and of uh, Left Behind, and we correspond all the time. And there's so many things we agree on. We don't worry about the the distinctives right. that we right. might not, not totally agree on. We love Jesus, and He said, "If you're not for me, you're against me." And He also said, "If you're not against me, you're for me." And right. certainly. If somebody's of a different stripe, we, we could we could look at the differences and argue about them, but that doesn't mean they're not for Jesus. <laughs> and, and maybe the, the, one of the many things that I love about the show, between Dallas and Jonathan and the writers and the cast, the, the portrayal of Jesus of um, sharing the truth in love, you know, um, yep. saying... Um, seeing him struggle sometimes as it, the scriptures tell us, you know, he gets frustrated, whether it be with the friars, scribes and Pharisees or, or the apostles when they're failing to get what he's trying to lead them towards in terms of, you know, seeing the presence of God in each person, no matter their circumstances, no matter um, how yeah, obstinate yeah, they may be at the moment or that he, that how that comes out is just so. Yeah. And that's one of the hallmarks of this next season. You're going right? to see Jesus start to really speak out against the Pharisees and, and says, woe to you, you know, and right. uh, and you're straining at gnats and that type of thing. It's going to be really powerful. This this is going to be a really moving season. Right, right. So what's next for you, Jerry? Well, I have finished the novel for season four, and that'll be out later this year. 
And uh, so I'm waiting for the scripts now for, for season five. And so that'll be the next thing on my plate. Oh. And is it uh, the uh, is it seven seasons? Is that the whole plan? Right. It's going to be seven seasons. Right. So right. Uh, the, at the end of season four, um, it will, will be just about the beginning of Holy Week. And so I mm-hmm. think season five will be, we'll, we'll cover all of Holy Week. And then season six, they've, they've already announced that season six is the crucifixion, season seven is the resurrection. Wow. So it's going to be wow. really dramatic. Well, and um, that season four is coming out uh, two weeks before Lent and, you know, a few at a time uh, for us, um, you know, I think uh, it's it's good timing and I, I'm sure it's going to help a lot of people um, to be closer to the Lord in prayer and, and be closer to the Word of God and in that, you know, reflection on the Scriptures. So, Please, um, on behalf of one from humble bishop from uh, New Jersey, please tell uh, Dallas um, how grateful we are um, for um, for all that they're doing, and, and yourself as well, um, as a dad, as a dad, and and as a writer. I'll definitely tell him, and uh, and that is our prayer that this this would really bring people closer to the Lord. So, so much so appreciate you having me on. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, Jerry. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. We'll be in touch. God bless you. God bless. Thanks. Take care. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, that was a fun interview, Bishop. What what do you think? Thank you, Jay. Thanks for setting that up. And uh, uh, really a pleasure. Um, We could have talked to him for a lot longer Mm -hmm. whether on many topics. But um, uh, again, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And, you know, faith and family. And to see a a dad and a son, um, you know, Give the, use the talents God has given them as, um, um, as he said, uh, to bring the loaves and the fishes and allow the Lord to work a miracle. And mm-hmm. and uh, and they've certainly had, um, as as he said, uh, lightning strikes twice. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, amazing, <laughs> amazing. But um, yeah. it was uh, grateful, for, grateful for his time. Yeah. Well, good. All right. So, um, what else? What What are you looking forward to in in the days ahead? So, um, oh, glad you mentioned, I almost forgot. Uh, um, so, um, this coming Friday, I'll be, as I said, at Holy Spirit, uh, Pequannock for a school visit for Catholic Schools Week. And uh, this coming Sunday in the morning, uh, as we celebrate our Salesians today, uh, um, we, well, this the third Friday, excuse me, getting my days here. Friday the 2nd, also in the evening, we're going to have a Project Andrew in Sparta. So um, uh, praying for vocations and meeting with some young men might be open to the priesthood. And uh, the third, <laughs> uh, the second, the Feast of the Presentation of the Lord, um, Candle Mass Day, sometimes called Candelaria mm. in Spanish. Um, and um, the third, we can get our throat breast, as my cough is getting a little bit better, uh, on the Feast of St. Blaise. And then the fourth, um, World Day of Prayer for Consecrated Life. And we're having a Mass at the Cathedral I believe 10 30 um on sunday the fourth uh so we'll invite our women and men religious uh, and consecrated life to come and be represented and we join with them in prayer and with the universal church and in, in giving thanks for those living um the vows of consecrated life um so um and then in the afternoon on sunday um we're gonna have our second annual um ecumenical prayer service for Black History Month. And oh, yes. again, Monsignor Gino at the cathedral and others, Father Ben Williams, uh, we've been meeting with a group of um, pastors, African-American pastors from the city of Patterson, many churches um, in, the, in the city of Patterson. And we're going to come together and the theme um, of this year's um, Black History Month, I, I believe, is has to do with art. And we're going to there's going to be a, a guest preacher who's going to speak on uh, the meaning of, of music in in the African American community, Black community, and the ex- their experience um, oh, uh, uh, here in the in the United States. And yeah. so, um, come down on the cathed- uh, to the cathedral. I believe it's four o'clock on um, Sunday afternoon. Um, yeah. The uh, Ecumenical Service for Black History Month. Yeah, looking forward to that. All right. Well, and then uh, two weeks next week we can talk about. Uh, the Chiefs and 49ers in the Super Bowl. Oh, uh, yes, so, of um, course. Yeah, Who yeah. are you rooting for? Uh, I I was a 49ers fan, but I look like Patrick Mahomes and Coach Andy Reid. Uh, so um, it should be a good game. Uh, I feel bad for the Lions. Yeah. Uh, they were they had it. They seemed to be – they had it in the first half. And But um, – so it should be a good game, a rematch, I think, from four years ago. Mm-hmm. 
All right, Bishop. Well, thanks for another great episode. And thank you all for spending time with us. Get to know us a little better by following Beyond the Beacon on Facebook or Instagram. I hope you'll join us for the next episode. And don't forget to subscribe, comment, and leave a positive rating. If you're watching on Bishop Kevin Sweeney's YouTube channel, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications. Email questions and podcast topic ideas for the bishop to beyond at pattersondiocese.org. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. God bless you. Take care.